first is from Romans, verse 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. And from Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of the dwelling where God lives by his spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And now those of you who attend Wiggle Worship can meet in the back. Thank you. You may be seated. So but before we go uh, any further, I, I wanted to, and I, and I forgot, forgive me, but uh, I forgot to give on, our online folks a specific time to light their candle if they've, they've done that. And I want to make sure that we have that opportunity. And so uh, for those of you that are, that are participating and experiencing our worship today online, I invite you now uh, to remember your lost loved one to say their name out loud. May God grant you peace, the only peace, the kind of peace that only God can give. And may your hearts be comforted and be stirred and encouraged to live out your faith, the Christian faith as the church, knowing that you will see them again in Jesus name. Amen. Friends, you're invited to be part of a reunion. So I've been talking about the last few weeks. And uh, I encourage you to, uh, to consider this idea of a reunion as something not like an event, something that we can put on Facebook as something we're going to attend or not attend or maybe are interested in, but instead it's a mindset, a condition of the heart, a state of the soul. Are you part of God's family? This call, this invitation can't just be about, hey, you know, get back into the habit of things, although that's maybe a good idea. It's more than that. It's not where we are on Sundays as much as who we are Monday through Sunday. It's about identity. Let me ask you, are you his church? Are you his church? The holy Catholic church that we affirm the Apostles' Creed cannot be isolated individuals separated always from each other whose only connection is sharing mere intellectual assent to the same beliefs that cannot be what Jesus had in mind. No, the church is the family of faith, people who belong to God by belonging to each other. No, it doesn't have to be necessarily this particular church. Oh, I'd like it to be. I'm a selfish pastor. I'll admit it. I'd love to have you as, as a, uh, one of my folks that I'm pastoring here would love that. But it's got to be some church somewhere. It doesn't even have to be an institutional church, but it's got to be real people. You know, not not imagine people 
not uh, hypothetical people. We always agree with hypothetical people. They have the same opinions we do. It's got to be real people that can get on your nerves and you get on their nerves. That's being the church. Practically speaking, friends, we're in a time in our culture, I believe, where so approximately the next six weeks are going to determine the next six to 12 months about how healthy and vital we're going to be. It's time for reunion. Now, the first way we talked about this a few weeks ago was to pull up a, t a table uh, or pull up a seat at the family table. Rather, we, we have to help people see church differently. We have to ask them, hey, have you have you, are you claiming your spot at the family table? We tend to look at the cross as the central image of our faith, the sacrifice of Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's OK for us to do. I just ask that you remember what Jesus said was the symbol Jesus said the, the table, the bread, the wine. He said, Rem by this, remember me. And I think that's no coincidence that in such a symbol, we can't grow close to Christ without also being close to others. Such is the image of the table. Which begs the question, how do you see the family table? How do you see the faith family table? Is this the kind of table you imagine? Like a family reunion, an extended reunion, people gathering around, sharing. We know some more better than others. Some we're not sure who they are or how they got here, kind of a thing. You know, that's the family faith. Do you see your faith being a, as much, oh, this is good. Do you see your faith being as much about others as it is God? Or is your, is your understanding of faith like that of Jesus, that it's the family table, or... Is your image more like this one? What's the family table? How do you see? How do you interpret Jesus' commissioning to be his church? Certainly, Jesus intended one more than the other. Last week, we spoke about baptism. In the sense of that's about claiming your family name, claiming the family inheritance. When I was 25 years old and my first son was born, they immediately asked, what's his name? And when we gave him his name, two immediate things happened. First, he was identified with our family. That's the first thing, immediately. Belongs to this one. And the second thing is he owned everything I had, which wasn't much, but it doesn't matter. Once you get the family name, you have the family inheritance. It's automatic. In baptism, the family of God places the family name on the child, regardless of whether the child is eight days old or eight years old or 80 years old. This child of God now has the family name. Chris Bryant baptized in Christian faith, Christian. And with it comes the family inheritance, Christ himself. That's then, then the next thing is it's our choice. Just like my boys, all three of them have a choice of whether or not they'll accept their identity and live up to and embrace the family name and, and whatever inheritance I offer them. It's their choice. You have a choice. Do you embrace the family name? Christian. Do you embrace the family inheritance? Christ. Most people are baptized and spend the rest of their life living away from it. I'm asking, are you living into it? What direction are you pointed? Away from your baptism or into it? Baptism, friends, means no matter what else happens to us, no matter what we go through in life or in death, God has claimed us and we can find all we need in claiming him. Today, the specific title of the message is membership, taking on a family commitment. But this week I realized that's not a very good title. I thought a better name, a better analogy to what church membership means is this, accepting family expectations. That's really what it's about. That's a better title. Accepting family expectations. That's what membership means. Of course, it's about commitment. You know, we know this. But, but to draw the comparison and analogy to a, the family metaphor, families really don't talk about family commitments per se. I mean, they might on occasion. But, but mostly, most of the time, families, the language that we use, typically how we understand it and sometimes disagree about it, is the idea of expectations. What's expected? Think about the expectations of being a family. There are expectations of family blessing and celebration when weddings happen. 
There's an expectation of family support and care in funerals. There's an expectation of physically being with the family. If you're able, if you're physically able, come be with the family in both those times. Bring food <laughs> or something else. Some other sort of, sort of support. Holidays are loaded with expectations. All sorts of expectations of participation in various traditions, including gift giving. There are also other special times, birthdays, graduations, big anniversaries, all times when family expectations, sometimes we could say obligations, come into play. Your involvement in such things, one way or another, is part of what it means to be family. I want you to think about that for a moment. How else are you family? How else does that work? I mean, technically, you may be a family member because you share some measure of DNA with people. There might be some connection with name or names. But how are you being family? You see the difference, right? That's what this worship theme is all about. It's about being church, being God's family. As we read today in Ephesians 2, all of us carefully join together in him. When it comes to expectations, some families are better than others about understanding each other's needs and, and being flexible with regard to those expectations, recognizing the limitations of any particular person or individual family unit. I know my family's been very gracious to me over the years, understanding that not only am I physically hundreds of miles from them, but, but even more challenging, the, the role that I serve in as, as a pastor and the kind of uh, difficulties I, I find each year with calendaring uh, events and, and even special occasions. Sometimes in families there are particular challenges with, with a person's health. That person, that particular family unit requires special provisions if they're going to be involved in that event, in that family get-together, in that thing, that family function. Or sometimes it's the one with the newest baby. Well, normally they'd be here, but we can't expect them to come today. They don't want to get the baby out yet. I like to keep the baby a little close by. Or maybe it's because it's their third or fourth baby and they're just too tired. We need to lay off. Of course, split, mixed families have their own unique challenges. Two sets of parents, double numbers of in-laws. I don't know anything about that. I say all this to say that families don't give up on expectations just because it's challenging. They sometimes have to be altered. Sometimes they have to be adjusted, realigned, or even reimagined in order to accommodate the changes in family. Better families learn how to do this so that the family can still be family in new ways. That's the role of the family, you see. The role and the expectation of the greater family back towards each individual person and family unit within it is the expectation that, that, we'll, that we'll try to do our best to adjust and accommodate whatever needs there are. In return, the expectation is that each person and family unit will do their best to get on board with whatever the new plan is for being family. You see, in the end, regardless of how accommodating the family is, each person, each household still has to choose whether or not if they will be family or not. If so, if, if, how, how are they going to be family? What's your level of commitment in your family? What's your level of commitment in the family of faith? What's your level of commitment? What's your level of involvement in the family of God? Yeah, we as a, a greater church family are constantly struggling on how to be more accommodating, more helpful to each individual household. How can we do so that makes people feel welcomed and comfortable? How do we adjust and respond? This is part of what our responsibility is as the greater family of faith. A family of faith must be understanding about the particular challenges that each of us face today. We have to develop new ways of being family. But in the end, in the end, what the family, the greater family cannot do is the family cannot be family for you. Can I be family for you? The greater family faith can only be so accommodating. At some point, you still have to choose, are you going to be involved? Are you going to accept the, accept the expectations to be family? Or do you want to be family in Christ, Christ family in name only? What's the choice? We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members 
on a roll? No, of one another. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. I told you last two weeks, this is in the Bible. I probably want to show you today. You are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house. Not individually. Not individually. Together we're his house. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him. Active membership in some church, again, doesn't have to be this church. I wish it was. Want it to be. But it has to be some group of people. Some group, um, actual people, somewhere. Active with them. It means you're understanding, fulfilling these scriptures. It means you get the family expectations. And in return, you receive all the benefits. I'm going to keep saying this over and over again. Self centered, isolated, independent Christianity doesn't work. Church is God's plan, there's no backup plan. Genuine community produces transformation. And such community cannot be built on, con- built on convenience. It can't be built on feelings that come and go. It's built on conviction. Nothing shapes our life more than the convictions that we have when those convictions become public commitments. I'll say that again. Nothing shapes our life more than the convictions we have when they become public commitments. That's why we make big deals out of weddings. That's internal convictions being expressed expressed very publicly. Or when you, you enlist in the armed services, you take an oath publicly. Or an elected office, there's a public oath. Nothing shapes and forms us like inward convictions expressed in public commitment. The public commitments we make by virtue of deep convictions we hold determine what we ultimately will become. Active membership in church, God's family, is how Christ changes your life. Be, because active membership means an ongoing public commitment to Christ. Walter uh, Walter Brueggemann, one of the great theologians and scholars of our time, has said that one of the reasons uh, reasons why people don't experience the kind of transformation that I'm talking about, transformation that comes from genuine community, is that most churches in America, this is him speaking, most churches in America invite people into membership with a wink and a nod that essentially means they can join and everything about them can can remain pretty much the same. In other words, the family expectations are never made clear. We try not to make that mistake here. Members experience a 90-minute class that essentially incorporates teaching on spiritual disciplines, that is the spiritual practices of the faith, things we do as individuals, and connecting that, though, with a better understanding of what church is, who the church is, what the church does. There's an intentional explanation of the connection between the inner and invisible personal faith in Christ that that we're offered And the outward public display of that commitment as members of the church. That's how it works. It's the plan. No backup plan. To reinforce this, when people join, those of you that have experienced me, uh, a membership here, they're, they're always asked about their commitment to Christ. That's the first questions we ask. Is Jesus the Savior of your soul and the leader of your life? Yes, yes. Well, will you then cooperate with His Holy Spirit who seeks to transform you into His very image, your thoughts, your words, your actions? Yes, yes. Then, then we say... Will you then demonstrate such inward, personal commitment outwardly by your commitment to this church and your prayers and your presence and your gifts and your service and your witness? That's how it works. And of course, if you've seen me do this, you know that these folks are up here standing in front. And I always invite those who are already members to also stand at that time and join them. A subtle reminder, we're being built together. This is Christian faith. This is the truth of the gospel. I wish I could do more at times. It's a little hard. But I will tell you, when I had the chance to start a a Methodist church and and start off with a blank slate, I decided to do a membership class that lasted 12 weeks in length. And believe it or not, we still took people in. (laughs) Um, In fact, we... uh, 
it changed over time. We, at one point it was an overnight retreat and the eventual form that we kind of settled on, and this it was years in the making, but eventually we just settled on an all day Saturday. And so if you wanted to be a member of that church, you had to come to a Bible study because I wanted every member, after you're going to be a member, I wanted, you to, I wanted to know you've been to at least one Bible study. Uh, what, what else are you joining? Why are you joining? If you, you're right. So I thought that, and then I wanted everybody to have that same common frame of reference. And so it would show up at 8 a.m. on Saturday and it'd last till about four. And you think, wow, that's amazing. How many, <laughs> actually people were excited to come. You know, it took us, you know, we had to talk to people and, you know, teach them and, and invite them and, but you know one thing about that church? It was interesting. Any given Sunday in worship, 90% of our membership was in worship. See, when you make the family expectations clear, people will be part of the family. They get it. When you say, this is what it's going to be about. You know, we, we talked about what it means to follow Jesus, not just believe in him. We talked about salvation and, and what it really means, not just the religious terms. But I would ask him, like, we're going to spend some time now talking about how Jesus' suffering and death helps. And I'm not going to allow you any religious words. You're going to have to explain it on your own. And we're going to work through this together. You talk about eyes being open. People finally started to catch on what Jesus is trying to do and what God has done in him in his suffering death and glorious resurrection. We would talk about how to share our faith, how to invite others into the life of faith, into the church. We would talk about the Holy Spirit and what it means to grow mature in Christ. And of course, how all of that ultimately means we're the church. Not bricks or mortar, but people, his church. God wants to save the whole world, including you, and include you in the saving of the whole world. And that's not two steps. It's actually one and the same thing. God wants to save the whole world, including you, and include you in the saving of the whole world. Ultimately, I would talk about the purpose and mission and vision of that particular church and how membership uh, meant those uh, things were now yours to fulfill. And, uh, uh, but speaking more generally today for the purpose of the sermon, uh, membership means Jesus' purpose of church. Stay with me. Jesus' purpose of church is now your purpose in this church. Jesus' mission of church is now your mission in this church. Jesus' vision of church is now your vision in this church. That's what membership means. Now, you may be having a little trouble right now imagining what those things are, the answers that you could give. I, I could help you with it some, but, but maybe this is an opportunity to think, wait a minute, maybe... Maybe I need to reevaluate a little bit. Am I part of God's family and name only? If so, I want to invite you to take the next step. Be the family of faith. Friends, I haven't found anywhere in the gospel or in the New Testament where Jesus is interested in keeping all of your spirituality just between you and him. You know, private, on the down low. Hush, hush. In the New Testament, the church is something you're either part of or not. The people of God, the family of faith. The church is those persons who are connected to Christ and connected to each other. Jesus' church has amazing resources, and I'm looking at them. Membership means moving away from being among the many, many people whose primary connection to church is to look at it as a resource, to them understanding themselves as part of that resource. We, though many, are one body in Christ, individually members one of another. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You are no longer strangers or foreigners. You're citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together. We are carefully joined together. We are carefully joined together in him. The great Christian author C.S. Lewis noted that the word membership is of Christian origin. It was Christians that first coined and used the word as a description of the nature of the relationship between them. 
We read in the New Testament we're members of Christ. That is, we're organs or parts of the body. That's the original use. We still kind of use that as a word today, but, but that's really a secondary or even third use of the word member. We, we forget that that's its origin. And what I'm telling you, what the argument that C.S. Lewis says, the reason we talk about being members of this club or not is because Christians change the meaning of the word. They took a word that represented different parts of the body, this member, this member, and said, that's who we are as the church. Indispensable, interconnected. Is that how you see Christian faith? Is that how you see others? The Bible teaches that each member, each of us, gets our meaning, our purpose, directly or indirectly, as being part of the whole. My heart only has meaning because it's part of me. You cut it out, and it'll cease to have purpose. My lungs have special meaning. But if you remove them, no. Only together. Believing this, friends, has the power to combat one of our biggest problems, self-centeredness and pride. Because by committing ourselves to a community of faith, a family of faith, it ensures that there'll be plenty of times where you and I will have other opportunities, or opportunities rather, to put others first. When I commit to the family of faith, it's where I can learn that I don't actually need my way to happen in order to be happy. Church is where I can come to appreciate other people's perspectives. And the real big thing, the real big thing we can learn, that we and our is way more important than me or my. Those are the family expectations that will change your life. It's a chance for us to finally accept that we're not perfect. Oh, I know we talk about, you know, of course I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But then we expect the church to be. Part of being the family of faith is saying up front, yeah, I know this church isn't perfect. There's all sorts of mistakes. I'm one of them. But I belong. And that means you belong. We're family. It's okay. We're Christ's family. We grow and go together. And so pull up a seat at the family table. Embrace the family name and inheritance. Accept the family expectations. Worship together. Online, in person. Give together, serve each other, and together we'll serve the world. Grow together, grow towards God in Bible studies and small groups. Let's, let's grow towards one another and, and so fulfill the law of Christ by caring for each other and bearing each other's burdens, celebrating every good gift that comes from the v above. For we're the family of faith. In name or in reality, I want you to be the church. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you've called us into this place, this house, this home, this family of faith, where we can be called special. And then we are. And at the same time, have the opportunity to have the chips knocked off our shoulder and be reminded that we just need to be humble and be one among others. How important those two lessons are. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to, to be involved in something bigger than ourselves. We, we thank you for the opportunity to be involved with people that disagree with us. We, we thank you for the opportunity to, to be involved in a place, a family where we're loved and accepted and at the same time challenged. Reminded that we're not perfect in part by seeing all the imperfections of others. A place, oh God, where we're challenged at times that things don't go the way we think and nonetheless, we can still be happy. Where we learn that we and our, we and our, those words are so much better than me and mine. So God, help us this day. Remember the importance of family and that even your family has expectations. The basic one is to not just claim the name, but, but actually be part of it. So help us as we leave today to think about where our place is in the family and how we might be more of the family we want to be the family of Christ. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.